This morning I'd like to just bring some thoughts that have occupied my heart and mind for a long period of time. We've looked at the series, and, and it's not complete by any means, the church in crisis. But in the midst of being in crisis, how do we stand? So the title of two messages and maybe a third in the midst of the complete series of the church in crisis, I've entitled this, this brief series, a subset if you like, Standing Firm in Crisis. The title of this message particularly, a paradox. To stand is to kneel. Our text, primary passage this morning will be taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. You may like to turn there, we will get to there eventually. Standing firm in crisis. To believe that there is no crisis is to deny the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of our adversary, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. We are aware that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual forces in heavenly places, which then exposes the very real fact that the crisis has been evident before we even took our place here on the earth. In fact, it reaches all the way back to when Lucifer challenged the Almighty and back to the revolt that took place in the Garden of Eden. But glory be to God. However, it has been arrested at the cross of Christ. This morning, please understand this fully. We may be in the midst of crisis but Christ overcame through the shedding of his blood, through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, the completed work. Even though our enemy is running around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, bringing crisis upon crisis, perplexity. The nations are perplexed. They have no answers. Their thinking is so wrapped up in the eternal establishment of, of trying to win popularity rather than defining and governing by truth, righteousness, justice. But this morning, it is all at rest. It is all dealt with under the glorious cross this morning. So as we magnify Jesus, as we see him lifted again in his right place at the throne of God, because he's no longer on the cross anymore, dare we impose a, a, a Catholic idea that he's still being hung? No, he was lifted and he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. The provision of salvation now is encompassing, far-reaching to every heart, without exception. It's all been arrested at Calvary. But we find this place in our lives as we traverse the the hill and dale and the plain of our Christian walk. Crisis always besets us. So how do we stand firm in this and how do we understand it in real terms? We're going to get through that in the next few weeks as we, we look at how we are going to, what can we actually use, what has been uh, provided for us. But this morning, let's look to the greatest example of what it is to not only be in crisis, but to stand firm in crisis. The Prince of Expositors, as he is well known as, Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, wrote in his Systematic on Christology, 
the crisis of the Christ. He writes, in all, in all the works of God, there is to be discovered an unwavering method of process and crisis. The process is slow and difficult to watch in its progress. The crisis is sudden and flashes with light, which flashes back upon the process, explains it, and forward and indicates a new line of action, which after all is the continuity of that which has already preceded it. What a great statement to explain the Christian life and certainly Christ's example. Jesus Christ's life and ministry is always our greatest example. And can I put forward to you the the seven critical crises that Christ demonstrated his life, his power, his resurrection, his glory, and his majesty, his eternal work. Firstly, we can see in the incarnation what a crisis that was. A crisis in heaven and a crisis in earth. The problem is we, 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 we attach crisis with, with a negativity, don't we? we? We say, oh, no. But in this crisis, for us, it is the incredible coming of the eternal Son of God to bring about God's purpose, to redeem us, to deal with that death blow seemingly in the garden, but no, arrest it with Christ's coming, his incarnation. Secondly, the baptisms, they were another crisis. Two baptisms, really, almost simultaneously. Christ says, to fulfill all righteousness, are we baptized in water? And, and John has him baptized. But then the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We, we know and we've covered in Luke that Christ knew the, the fullness, that we, without measure, the filling and dwelling of the Spirit of God. And if Isaiah, we also have covered that in our, our series. All of these series have been interlinked, all these thoughts that have come and how they've pieced together in my own heart and mind. Jesus being the anointed, I have come in the volume of the book it's written of me to do thy will, O God. But he came as the anointed one, the blessed one, the Messiah, to fulfill all righteousness. So these two baptisms, the incarnation, the two baptisms. Thirdly, his temptation. His temptation after 40 days, it summarizes in those three particular uh, antagonistic declarations and, 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 and entrapments that Satan brought to Christ. But our Savior's response was, it is written. It is written. Fourthly, that moment getting to the hill, and there before James, uh, Peter, John, and there's other disciples, the three specifically, they saw the glory of God as Christ was transfigured before them. And the voice that spoke unquestionably saying, this is my beloved son, listen, listen, Hear ye him. God the Father confirming, I, I don't compare myself to my creation, but I can be compared to this one in whom all the fullness of God dwells bodily, Jesus, the Messiah. Listen to him. His words are my words. Fifthly, the, the crucifixion. What a crisis. That point that was in Christ's life where he surrendered himself to the will of the Father. We will deal with that a little bit more as we go on. The crisis then, the number six, the, the resurrection. The glory of God raised him, the power of God raised Christ from the dead. And that same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us to keep us and seal us against the day of reckoning when we will stand before the Lord. Finally, the seventh, the ascension, the ascension of Christ. Seven great crises. And in every situation, the Lord did what was right. 
These seven crises embodies the authorship of divinity and proves the plan and purpose of God the Father, provided by the Son and then revealed by the Holy Spirit to every heart that has been transformed by the saving grace of God through Christ's completed work on the cross. It is evident then to me that this same process and crisis that Christ knew would be our example and experience. I saw this evident in even the disciples' life, and specifically as we could look briefly at Simon Peter. We can so easily identify with his humanness is his responses to so many areas. Firstly, he, he left the nets of familiarity and livelihood to follow Christ. The call was given to him, follow me and I will make you. And, and Peter followed. Secondly, Peter talked and walked with the Lord. He even asked the Lord that I might walk on water and found the substance of his faith lacking because the flesh always got the better of him. Thirdly, third crisis, he received revelation from God, specifically from God the Father, as to the work, the purpose of the incarnate Son of God. We find that in Matthew chapter 16, as it's brought to life, the revelation that Peter understood, communicated by the Father, but Peter makes the declaration, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But only just a few verses later, turn with me please and see this clearly. Here, Peter espouses such incredible insight into who Christ was, but then only in verse 21 of chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16. Reading at verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and, he kill, and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this should not happen to you. But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of things of men. What an entrapment. What, 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 what a limited view that Peter expresses after seeing such the, of the majesty of who Jesus was. That Peter was mindful of fleshly, earthly things. Read it there in verse 23. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Herein lies an interesting aspect of our daily Christian walk. Our crisis can come because we have so listened to the, 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 the thinking of men, the indoctrination, the, the subtleties. You know these thoughts. They're not new. They've been preached here for so many, many weeks after weeks, months, years. Yet, we have Peter who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus. Even John explains that his hands had handled the word of life, the word of truth. Yet, we find him speaking carnally. We so easily 
can be captivated by thought and great pursuit and become a crisis in our hearts and lives. But let's not get sidetracked there. There's so much more to discover. Fourthly, the fourth crisis. Peter denies the Savior. Matthew 26, verse 75, and after realizing what he had done, he wept over his transgression. Yet in John, John's gospel, we see that Peter is then restored. What a crisis that was when there is a restoration, a, a bringing in and a communication of Christ's life and love for him, for Peter himself, but also for the work that must be now carried out. And Peter's commission to feed the Lord's sheep and his lambs. Sixthly, on the day of Pentecost, another crisis besets the disciples and Peter being in their midst. And the power of God came. The person of the Holy Spirit made himself so very present, filling them, making them to be witnesses continually, perpetual while they continued always to wait upon the Lord. Seventhly, Peter bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in and through his own death. You can read of Peter's last and final words in 2 Peter 3, 14 to 18. Read those when you get home. 2 Peter 3, 14 to 18. His last words that he penned that were written, recorded for us. Tradition would have it that Peter was put to death, but not in the same way as our Savior. He didn't want to be identified with that work. But rather, being crucified upside down, he testified that the same one, Jesus, who came, who walked and talked with him, who gave him revelation, was able to keep him against the day of reckoning when he would give the ultimate sacrifice, his life, for not just the truth that he knew, but for the relationship that he bore witness to. Remember, friends, our walk with the Lord is not about words on the page. If we just read words and there was no life, then we have a dead religion. And even in our church, this, this ecclesia, we can be so guilty of furnishing our mind with so much. The wealth of the scriptures are incredible. Yet we can miss that intimacy of relationship that will keep us against that day. So Peter faced as another example to us. Seven crises. A crisis is a place, a valley or a mountain in front and around us requiring decisions. A crossroad, on the other hand, is a decision that requires us to transit through. the greatest example of how one is to respond in the midst of a crisis is when Jesus was in the garden, Gethsemane's crisis. Turn with me now to Matthew chapter 26, reading at verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Just consider that. They'd just been at table, the Last Supper, the ordinances of the church given, do this in remembrance of me. And they sang a hymn, not a 7-Eleven, 
7 Eleven, you know what a 7 Eleven is? A song that has seven lines sung 11 times. Mindless, but overflowing with emotion. Well, our, f- our faith is not built on emotion. Our faith is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly rest in Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And they sang a hymn. Our day-to-day life must have that expression of worship, our gratitude that must be Godward. How we are so wonderfully blessed with the presentation of music that is always put second place as, as ushers directing us all individually come. Come this way, come and see the King. Come unto the King of Kings. Come into his throne room. Don't sit on the back but come and enter in. And they sang a hymn. Verse 31, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Wow. As an aside, it is interesting to note the detail that is captured by the Holy Spirit as only John in his gospel confirms the location to which the disciples returned to their former occupations at the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus prepares for them breakfast. And this is that, 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 that sixth instance of crisis that Peter had when he's restored and in commission to go and feed and tend the lambs. And here, the Lord says, I know what's happening. I know what's coming, even in the midst of the crisis that are about to unfold for me. I'm going to see you in Galilee, and I'm going to reunite you to my word and to my purpose and to me. How glorious that even this detail is, doesn't escape the Spirit of God to confirm to us where and when things will happen in his perfect timing and in his perfect way. Verse 36, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to his disciples, found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, What, could you not wait with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink of it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Gethsemane's crisis 
We can read of the accounts in, in, in all four Gospels. Matthew 26, as we've read, Mark 14, verse 26, 32 to 42. Luke 22, verse 39 to 46. And the Gospel of John, chapter 18, and verse 1. Conventional wisdom would say Jesus was weak because he displayed emotion. He, he bowed himself to the ground, displayed such sorrow of soul, it says. Verse 38, just, just remind yourself in what it said. Then he said to them, he declares to his brethren, who specifically? Those three that were in close fellowship with him, Peter, James and John. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. This carpenter was not physically without strength. Our Lord was never insipid, never pathetic, never effeminate. But we do find three distinct decisions our Lord made. And this is the burden of my message to you this morning. As Christ is our example, what did he do in the midst of this incredible situation? Gethsemane, the crisis of will. The first decision that our Lord makes, reading in verse 39, he went a little further. There were three positions. There's all the disciples together and he brought them and he said to them, sit down here. But then he took the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and then Peter, and brings them to where he decides to pray. And then he removes himself even from the company of these three. Even in the company of companions, there is often time we must go it alone. For the preacher, the pastor, the elder, deacon, prophet, evangelist, apostle, we can understand those. They must go that extra mile, that distance. But what about you husbands, leaders, men, young men, boys, husbands and fathers, friends, Christian? If you name yourself a Christian, you must go a little further. You see, we've been given a burden from the Lord. Particularly those who submit themselves to serve the Lord and to serve his body. A burden that is immense and in the natural speaking, no right-minded person would take on the responsibility of fulfilling the call to ministry in a public setting. We're all called to minister. I've said this so many times. We are all to do the work of the ministry. And that's going to be clarified in some other messages as we move forward. But everyone has a responsibility to the Lord, not to me. The burden is great and it's from the Lord that which our spirit is so uniquely yoked to carry. It's a work that God does in us to prepare all men for the work that they must do in this life, ready for that which is to come. Husbands, you have a unique burden and responsibility that God has prepared you for. This is a crisis of your life. Don't underestimate it, what is required. 
even under the Jewish system of preparation. It was those coming into marriage must separate themselves from uh, the, 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 the responsibilities that would normally be upon young men. Sadly, in our society, all of that has been used as a cop-out for men to be lazy. If we are to have men, men are built to be busy and to work. Yes, work with our minds. Yes, work with our hands. The capacity for both is incredible. God has made us so. Get your boys busy. Give them tasks at home to fulfill. Train them in the ways they should go. Give them in, giving them ever-increasing responsibility by which what happens effectually, it bridles their purpose. It sets them on the course for the way that they should travel because you as a husband, as a father, should already be doing such yourself. Not sitting around, lounging around, loafing about, playing video games and doing every such thing. This is a trap in our times, the ease of life. And this is where sudden destruction comes. We're not about the purposes of God. We're not waiting on God to know what he requires of us. You must go a little further. Others may not be so burdened, but you are. You who hear the leading of the Lord must go further, further in denial of self, further in sanctification of mind, of body, of soul, further in travail of soul in response to the depth of responsibility, knowing the sweetness of his fellowship in that place that is separate at times, distant from those around us, to be with him in solitude. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 12, and 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. Take these home and, and look at these for yourself. Maybe we'll get to the first one, 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And verse 12, it is, let me say as a, as a caveat here, it is dangerous to take just a scripture out and, and try and build a thought around it. That's not what we do here. But when we submit a verse, it is built into the context of what is being presented. And if you read the context, how I'm presenting it to you now this morning, it fits in my understanding of scripture. Six, chapter six, verse 12 all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. The basis of this was um, uh, the work of the body and also keeping from idols. The second passage that I've said here, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 23, brings the same light. And Paul brings to our knowledge Yet we could do anything because I, I, I have faith and I trust God, but not everything that I do is helpful and beneficial for keeping and preserving my walk with the Lord. And so much for those who aspire to ministry. Not everything is acceptable for those who are called to follow the Lord in service to minister. Others might be able to do it fritter away time, do things that are helpful and beneficial physically, but yet it's the use of your time that you have been given, your talents and your abilities. 
and how they are bridled and are used. Paul says, I could do all these things, but I don't want them to be that power that stops me from fulfilling what God requires of me. We must go that extra mile. We must go a little further. All of us, ladies included, Jesus went a little further. What did he do next? He fell on his face. Jesus was totally totally dependent on his father. There must be surrender, not to the crisis or the terms of the situation, but but toward the father who calls us his sons and his daughters. It is there in weakness, as we have turned to Christ, He is made strong in our weakness. Paul acknowledges this very point in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians 12, 8. Concerning these things, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Oh, friends, not only do we need to come and go that extra separated the disposition of heart must be that we fall on our face. Herein is not the excuse for besetting sins, for the writer of Hebrews calls us to lay aside besetting and entangling sin. And what does it say? To run the race set before us. Philippians 3 verse 12, we press on to what? What do we press on to? Perfection, the higher calling that is in Christ. Romans 12, verse um, verse 2. And what what does that say as an admonishment to us? And not being conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of our mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The action of self-abasement is true worship. Falling on our face is the right of priests, the privilege of sons and daughters, and the proof of selfless dependence. He went a little further. He fell on his face. We have this right as priests to worship. And in the midst of crisis, the expression of our hearts in song is so very critical to maintaining our attitude and disposition even in the midst of what we are facing. I have proven over and over again that if I would grab hold of those hymns and songs that would direct me to praising him, I will praise him. Praise the lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. In this expression that we verbalize, not just keep it in our heart, but we express, oh Lord, we worship you in the midst of crisis. The heart is so captivated with his glory, 
his life. That the things of this world just seem strangely dim in the light of his glory, grace. This action, as I read again, this action of self-abasement is the right of priests, the privilege of sons, and the proof of selfless dependence. A person who is on their knees, they have no strength. They have no position, no stronghold. You think of those who came even to the water to drink. They may, be, they may have knelt, but they were ready. They, they grabbed the water with their hands and brought it up to their mouth, though they might have put, put down to one knee where the others were put to one side. Yes, they came to the waters and drank, but they were so occupied with the here and the temporal that they weren't ready for what was happening around them. Gideon was instructed to only choose those 300 men who, yes, bowed their knee but were ready even while on their knees. Thirdly, what was, what was it that Christ did just in that verse 39, those, this, this third aspect of what it is in the midst of this paradox of how we stand in Christless, what did he do? Thirdly, he prayed. He went a little further. He bowed his knee and he prayed. In all human thought and wisdom, this does not make any sense, does it? No, we have to defend our position. We're right, they're wrong. We've got so much we could say. We could defend ourselves. Jesus' example was he opened not his mouth at his accusers. In the midst of our crisis, where do we find ourselves? He prayed, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as you will. Oh, dear heart, if there ever was a time to pray, it is now. It is the last hour. There can be no other place we go but to that place of personal, secret, and consecrated prayer. Can I also say it is not what you pray, it is that you pray, for the crisis of the hour will rightly offer up the travail of that anguished heart. This has been my experience at different instances and in different crises. There has not even been a word that I could pray. But even as the spirit moves, the groaning of our hearts, we intercede and we pray in Jesus' name. And the recount of the scripture is that it is heard in heaven and our Savior intercedes for us when we have no words. He commands all men everywhere. All words and all power and all authority are his. He instigated language. He instigated, he instigated communication. And he communicates to us his love and eternal Godhead. But we ignore him. And we hold the truth in unrighteousness and suppress the truth. or well, the world does. But how in Christ? So we, we limit God. Oh, you don't know what I'm feeling. You don't know what I'm going through. If we would travail in prayer, friends, even without uttering word and, law, and, and, and have the situation be expressed from our spirit to spirit, we would find that reality of victory in Christ. It might not be resolved there and then. Remember, it's not about having these situations to come and stay. It's that they all come to pass, don't they, in our lives. 
Crises always come and go. The words and the unspoken heart cry will voice what is necessary when a soul in truth lays bare on the hearth of the incense of prayer and praise. It was Leonard Ravenhill who penned these words that have resounded in my heart for years and years. When he wrote in the book, Why Revival Tarries, No man, no woman is greater than his or her prayer life. We all have an idea that we want to be so much for God. We we want to be on the cutting edge and we, we want to see so many come to the Lord. We want to affect people's lives with the truth because it's affected us. But our measure is so faulty when we measure ourselves against someone else and what might be happening in another arena. The standard is Christ. You can read through the passages of Scripture, particularly in Mark, and he found that place where he went away continually and he prayed. That place of seclusion, he, he, he drew himself away and he prayed. No man is greater than our Savior. And if his example is that which is penned for us to follow, how are we so burdened as he was burdened to pray? How often do we turn first to the Lord when we are confronted with a crisis? Or do we get on the phone and have to tell somebody about it? Go around and see our mums and dads and friends and yes, there's wisdom in counsel and there's wisdom and, and, and great resource in telling and halving a burden by making it known to somebody in, in confidence and in private. But have you turned to the Lord first? In the midst of every situation, we turn to him. We make our voice known. Just think of it. Consider Daniel was seemingly backed into a corner facing the ministerial assassination posse. They were after him. They didn't like Daniel and he was this this man who came from that wayward, backward nation of Israel and and we are in Babylon and we've got it all we've got knowledge we've we've got power we've got military might we've got everything turn with me to Daniel chapter 6 Daniel 6 and verse 9 therefore King Darius signed the written decree Verse 10, Daniel chapter 6. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Daniel wasn't doing something new to him. And Daniel wasn't just threatened by what was taking place and thought, oh, I better turn to prayer. God's going to have to help me now. 
No, he would already carrying out the pattern of his life. Oh, they're after me. Oh, what's new? What else is new? I mean, they're always out after me. The enemy's out after us. And he turned to prayer three times that day and did what he always did. He prayed in his prayer. He sought the Lord. Is this our example? Is this what we are doing now? Or is the crisis so evident and so encroaching upon the life of Christ in us? Stopping us, stifling the expression of who he is, his strength, his power, not ours. So often we would turn to rational thought, to a a rhetoric of defense and espouse our own self-justification. Yet, as the Lord demonstrated for us to follow, we must turn first to the Father in prayer. We pray We pray without ceasing. We pray. We pray away away from the crowd. The place of sanctuary and of solace directs the saint soldier to the only means he may stand firm. Come away. Come unto the Lord. Come and rest a while in his presence. The paradox is not that which is contrary to us, but the place we know we will hear the voice of the Lord speaking to our hearts. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Jesus went a little further. Jesus knelt. Jesus prayed. What is it to stand firm in crisis? Stand. Gives us the idea that we're going to be in control. In authority and in defiance maybe against the raging that is going on around about us. Brother, sister, friend, the only place for us to stand is to kneel. Are we so challenged? Have we affected our family so in our continuing seeking on their behalf their salvation or their return to the Lord because they have backslidden? Are we found in that place just separated from the noise and the clamor, finding ourselves in worship on our knees and making known the substance of the issue just to the Lord. To stand is to kneel. This is the incredible paradox. Christ, so purposefully, so committed to the Father's will, rises, returns to his disciples, says, come, let us go. It's time. Culminating in that trial four wicked men that ended up with Christ dying on a Roman cross. What a crisis. Yet days later, the power of God floods that tomb and he is resurrected. So to our faith this morning, so to our hope this morning, Let the glory of the light of Christ flood our hearts and minds this morning and no resurrection strength and power. And if we have not in the midst of crisis gone that little further, gone to that place on our knees, gone in prayer, we can return to that place this morning. Return to him this morning with a concerted decision of will and purpose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name that every heart, Lord, would get a hold of the revelation that you so purposefully and completely displayed while you were here. 
You constantly prayed. You sought the benefit of those around about you. And Lord, you sought your strength, not from within yourself, but from the eternal Godhead, from your Father, who strengthened you, who confirmed you at that day and said, this is my beloved Son, hear ye him. Oh Lord, that we would turn to you as Daniel did. And it would be our habit and our practice, no matter what we hear, no matter how much the, the, the rattling of sabers and swords may be round about us, Lord, we would have hearts readied, ready to defend the gospel. We would have eyes to see that the armies of God are encamped around about us to defend us, to keep us, for the purpose of God is to be fulfilled. Every letter, every aspect, every jot and tittle will be fulfilled according to your purpose, in your perfect timing. So Lord, in the midst of our crisis this morning, Lord, we purpose to go a little further. We purpose to fall in our knees and we purpose to pray and seek your face. Yes, for the situation we may be in, but Lord, so much more as we are burdened for others around about us. Help us now, we pray. Quicken your life in us. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen.